Hello everyone, it's Livy here, aka Story Minded, and welcome back to my channel. It's been ages. Um, I'm really excited to be able to finally finish my sort of um, documentation of my university experience. I'm talking about my final assignments. I've officially finished Fergid, it's just a long wait for results now. Um, but before I start this video to talk about one of my favourite creative writing modules that I had in my third year, um, I just wanted to give out some quick messages. I'm starting to sound like a radio host or a podcast host. Um, to the students who are obviously heading towards their exam period, I wish you the best of luck. If you're um, any, um, if there's any GCSE students or IGCSE students or A level students out there, please feel free um, on any of my videos to sort of send um, any questions. If you need help with anything, I'm always help happy to um, make videos to help students. Um, I've been accepted onto my PGCE course um, in September, which is both exciting and terrifying. Um, so it's always good teaching practice for me to be able to help students in any way I, I can and I'm always happy to make um, videos giving advice for exams and things like that. Um, and then the other sort of quick message I need to give is um, a bit of a trigger warning for this video, um, although I don't know why it would be a trigger point for some people, but I respect the fact that not everyone agrees with it, whether it's due to like religious beliefs or personal beliefs or whatever, even though we have heteronormativity shoved down our throats every single day. Um, this video will contain LGBTQ plus content of the L variety, so consider this your get out of jail free card if you don't want to um, hear discussion of um, anything to do with the LGBTQ plus community, um, you can leave, uh, because my writing project was to do with an amazing woman called Anne Lister, who I will get into talking about, and she was incredible, and she was a lesbian. Um, so it's just sort of a warning to let people know that you can go if that's going to sort of offend you in any way. And as a more sort of serious aside, this channel is a very safe space. I make it a safe space not only for myself, but for students. So if there's anyone who might be on my channel that might think, oh, that's not for me, don't want to hear that, then that's your right, you can leave. But I don't tolerate bullying, I don't tolerate harassment, I don't tolerate hate. And there's a difference between sort of sharing your opinion and being like really disgusting. Like I've seen it on the internet, I've seen so many disgusting hate comments on different videos and it's like, you can keep those negative thoughts to yourself. You're not being forced to watch anything that's making you uncomfortable. Um, but yes, I'm going to try and do something different with this video. So um, I'm going to, I've finally been able to get Audacity back on my computer, which is an amazing free piece of software. If there's anyone out there who's interested in like voice acting or doing podcasts or voice recording, Audacity is a brilliant piece of free software where you can record your voice. If you buy like a little cheap USB uh, microphone that's got good sound quality to it, um, it's really easy to use. I'm going to try and uh, show you my slides um, because one of the assignments we had to do for uh, my creative writing module, Fact and Fiction, was to uh, create a PowerPoint about our historical character. But before I get into um, Anne Lister and all the things I want to talk about, um, this is just the sort of introduction portion to the video. So, um, where do I begin with Fact and Fiction? Um, so we had two choices really. We had the chance to either find um, a character from a certain period of history and like it could be anything like you could use the 90s for example as a historical period. It could be like any timeline so long as it's pre whenever we were writing. Um, and we could take that real life person and use them as a character in our story or we could make a fictional character and drop them into a historical setting and the presentation um we had to create like a creative piece any form um using that character or the other version i said and um, my favourite part of this module was that at the end, our whole cohort got together and sadly because of COVID, we weren't able to do our presentations in person. Uh, but we had to sort of talk about our um, writing process and sort of explore the reasons behind why we picked our historical figure, like our sort of personal connection to the person. Um, and it was just amazing. I mean, we had such a range of different stories and 
inspirations and it was really touching and amazing to hear um all the different reasons why people had picked their characters and it was just incredible i mean we had um a really comedic one from um greek i think someone picked i think it was plato they'd done like a greek philosopher and sort of i think i think it was plato this was a while ago this was like back in like january <laughs> um and i think it was like a sort of descent into madness one there was um or oh that was it. it was plato and one of his biggest rivals but i can't remember who it was and it was sort of like their arguments and stuff and that was brilliant um someone did a vincent van gogh and sort of talked about um his mental health issues and sort of those topics and how art is therapy for them so it was very cathartic and it was just really fascinating um, but I went with Anne Lister, um, who I'll talk more about in the uh, slide portion of my video, probably, because then I can sort of go through what um, I talked about. Um, but we're dealing with the Regency period, so that's the Georgian era. Um, and Anne Lister was an incredible woman. There's so many different things that I want to talk about in this video um, about why she was amazing. She was definitely a tra trailblazer and very unconventional for her time and not just because of her sexual orientation. There are so many different reasons why she just stood out from the crowd. Uh, but she came from a very prestigious family in Halifax in West, West Yorkshire. Um, and I did a lot of research. I did my research over the summer to write my project and we did our presentations at the end so I'm sort of doing this back to front by giving you my presentation first and then I'll talk about the story that I ended up writing um, but before I transition to talk about my um, PowerPoint um, this was something that I had to cut out because we only had like five minutes to deliver our presentation which was really tricky considering how much they wanted us to like like how much detail they wanted us to go into but we ended up um, obviously having to do our pe presentations over Zoom, which was a new experience and share our screens and stuff like that. Um, so I think our lecturers were kind to us and they were sort of like, we're not going to be like totalitarian with the time, but just try and stick to it as best you can. And you had the chance to either write a script or just sort of just speak. And that's sort of a tip I'll give to anyone. If any of you ever have to do a presentation, I really recommend you rehearse it. Um, and if you need a script, that's valid, because to be fair, throughout my sort of university journey, I've had some presentations where I've, I've needed to have a script to help me stay on track. And sometimes there's just too many things that you want to talk about that you can't necessarily go without a script. But rehearsal is the best thing and it gives you confidence. Um, and I was really proud of my presentation because I had rehearsed it so much that I had it memorised what I wanted to say, even without a script. And I just completely just delivered it and smashed it and got a first which I was really proud of when I got a first overall for that module and when I get onto the other video of talking about the actual story that I wrote called The Incident oh I redrafted it so many times and it was such a hit and miss and it was really difficult but I ended up getting a first on that project too so I was really really proud of this module but um anyway I shall see you in a bit to hopefully be doing my voiceover with the presentation if I can get it to work thank you for listening and I'll see you in a sec. Bye. Okay, so I am, um, I forgot in that other bit to mention my uh, inspiration. Um, so prior to the project, sort of the reason how I discovered Anne Lister was through an amazing BBC programme called Gentleman Jack. I highly recommend it. It's a brilliant series written by Sally Wainwright, who's an amazing writer. She um, very much used Anne's own journals to bring her to life on screen. And she's portrayed by Saran Jones and she's just amazing. She just encapsulates Anne's spirit perfectly. But watching the show, it focuses on her relationship, her, um, it focuses on Anne's later years and her sort of last main relationship with a woman called Anne Walker. And after watching the show, I was just so interested and intrigued and I thought I need to read these journals for myself. So that's what I did over the summer. I got the first two books by Helena Whitbread, who did a lot of the groundwork for deciphering Anne's code because Anne's journals um, were written in two types um, of script. There was her crypt hand as she called it which was her code and then there was just her normal writing so Helena did a lot of amazing work to um, decode that 
and as I started to read the journals, um, this is a lot of stuff that I obviously couldn't put in my presentation because I didn't have enough time to talk about it. So after diving more into the entries, um, I was really shocked because in comparison to the show, there was hardly anything about Anne Walker in her like earlier diary entry. So the two books I used was The Secret Diaries of Miss Anne Lister, which details um, her sort of earlier years, and then No Priest But Love is the second one, and the first beginning title, but it's the same, The Secret Diaries of Miss Anne Lister, which documents her time she spent living in Paris and a relationship she has with a widower, because Anne had multiple relationships with multiple women throughout her life. It wasn't just Anne Walker. But the only sort of reference to Anne Walker or her family, it gets a bit confusing because there are multiple Anne's in Anne's life. But what I found really interesting was that in the um, the main book that I used for this project, The Secret Diaries of Miss Anne Lister, there was only like one reference to Anne Walker or potentially her aunt or her fa- a family member or Anne Walker herself. And what Anne, what Anne Lister had to say about her or slash her family was a uh, very um she she considered them to be vulgar and this is a word that Anne uses again and again in her entries to anyone who she doesn't like um she'll sort of put on the face to go to these boring social gatherings that she hates and all the social calls she has to make and she'll attend them and then she'll write behind their backs in her journal and be like oh well I think they're very vulgar and she'll just basically (laughs) unload all her real thoughts in her journal which is very empowering and very fun to read so obviously in comparison to the show and I I was like oh well I need to find out more about Anne Lister and Anne Walker's relationship because surely she must have written about her so I actually contacted Helena from her like website and I asked her out of curiosity like I told her what I was doing for my project and I was like really interested to learn more about that side of things um because I was quite surprised at the lack of references and she directed me to Jill Liddleton's book and she focuses on Anne's writings from 1833 to 36 so the latter period of her life and she it helped me sorry to find out that what's portrayed in the show obviously is using creative license and it's still very true to the journal entries but oh my gosh in comparison to the actual relationship that Anne had with Mariana Lawton who I will talk about in a moment it was completely different it was lackluster it was um, full of just this repetition of no kiss no kiss and back then kiss was a euphemism to mean sex so basically Anne all the time in these uh, later diary entries concerning Anne Walker she just talks about how they don't have sex whereas when she talks about Mariana they're constantly having sex when they meet up and um, they have a very sort of rocky intense and very toxic relationship um both parties involved um but it was just fascinating to read about so after doing all this research i decided that i wanted to write my project on the relationship or sorry more so the argument the main argument that drives that sort of final wedge between anne and mariana lawton because anne was obsessed with mariana and to a certain extent mariana was very much taken with and obsessed with anne But Mariana's issue was that where she was so worldly and she's constantly referred to as being worldly and materialistic, she can't, she's desperate to live with Anne and Anne has this dream that they're going to be able to live together as spinsters, which was a wonderful loophole back then uh, for lesbians. If you're a spinster and you never married, it was very normal to have like a female companion. And also bed sharing was a very normal occurrence between female friends, um, things like that. But obviously, if you're a lesbian and you had a friend, you were able to have this loophole to be with each other intimately, which Anne definitely took advantage of. But it was just heartbreaking because Anne, she's in so much pain like emotional pain she adores mariana but she knows mariana she knows deep down mariana would never do the same but she can't she can never quite move on from her and she never truly does um and she's always like saying oh she always makes references to the fact that she won't return to her but she always does and it's very infuriating to read when you read her journal entries you want to sort of go back in time and shake her and just be like she isn't good for you find find someone else who will treat you better but obviously anne is so courageous and brave to just basically pursue her heart and just live her truth and back then like she's basically to hell with the consequences I'm gonna love who I'm gonna love and yeah so that's just sort of the beginning bit that I wanted to put in here this is going to be a very long video
So I'm going to talk about my first slide. And the first slide is we had to sort of give a bit of biographical information about our person. So Anne Lister was born on the 3rd of April 1791 um, in West Yorkshire, Halifax. And she sadly died of fever um, on her way to Russia in 1839. Because one of the facts that I put about Anne is that she was a traveller. Anne hated, um, she absolutely despised her hometown, Halifax. Any chance she could get when she had the funds available, because even though she's from a prestigious family, I can't think of the right ranking system for this time period, but basically she's not like, they're not top of the top, like they're not mega wealthy, but they are they are very well off in comparison to other people. And she went to boarding school and all these sort of um, more sort of prestigious living, but she, they still sort of struggled to make ends meet because the, the men in her family were terrible businessmen, but we'll get We'll get onto that in a sec. But yes, she was a traveller and um, one of her favourite places was Paris. And as I mentioned from No Priest But Love, she actually goes to live there for a couple of years and she engages in this long um, this long liaison with this woman called... I think is it? Oh, I've forgotten her name. Oh, that's awful. Why have I forgotten her name? She gets involved with a young widow and basically <laughs> emotionally traumatizes her, which isn't good. Basically breaks her heart and then leaves her. So she has this fling with this young widow and then just leaves her and it's like, oh, well, I'm returning to England now, bye. But she loved traveling and it was on her last adventure where she was heading to Russia. She sadly never made it to Russia. She contracted fever and died only age 48 in 1839. So it's really heartbreaking and just a quick note, Anne Walker also had a very sad end because she had very poor mental health, which is one of the reasons why her and Anne Lister didn't get on well because Anne Lister has sort of, she refers to it as melancholy, which we can take to mean she had depressive episodes, but Anne Lister was such a resilient woman that she would very much uh, repress and push down these emotions and she'd always be able to overcome it. Whereas Anne Walker was very much emotionally manipulated by her family, treated like a child, and she was very much used by people. And uh, obviously Anne Lister wanted to come along and use her money to further her uh, mine coal, her mining business. She was in the business of mining, which is one of the other facts I have about her. She was an incredible entrepreneur. As I mentioned, her the men in her family, so like her father, uh, were terrible businessmen and she inherited her ancestral home, Shipton Hall, after her brother died in the army. I can't remember if he was in the navy or I think it was the army. Um, I can't find my uh, notes I had, sadly. I don't know if they got deleted. So this is going off my memory. But um, yeah, she inherited from her brother, Shipton Hall. But she hated the farm. She wanted she had her sights set on bigger things so she started up um Shibden Hall had um they had like coal pits and she wanted to sink them and that was kind of one of the motivations for getting with Anne Walker because they had more money than her and she thought ah oh, if I can get with her I can use her money to um to further my coal mining business which and actually in her writing she talks more about her coal mining business and her relationship with Anne which is quite sad but they do end up taking the sacrament together which is essentially getting married or their version of marriage back then um that they can do uh so that is quite empowering but yes it's not to say that their relationship was um it wasn't a positive relationship and it's interesting to see the differences in the show compared to the writing but yeah so that was one of them. Another fact about Anne is that she was an incredibly intelligent woman. She uh, could speak multiple languages. Uh, she was fluent in French and um, she also was a self-taught learner. So she, um, once she finished her boarding school education, she pursued more knowledge. So she had a, a fascination with medicine. Like she was fascinated by the smallpox pandemic and like the development of vaccinations for that. And she... Um, she was just incredible, really. She was just really interested in science and medicine because Mariana Lawton's uh, brother was a doctor, so she was always asking questions concerning that. And also when she ends up contracting um, an STI or STD uh, because of Mariana's husband, who I have a lot of hate to... <laughs> not a lot of hate. Um, he basically, Charles Lawton, was a very nasty businessman. He was ruthless and he was an adulterer. So, although obviously you can argue that Mariana was doing the same, but Mariana and Anne, long before Mariana married, Mariana and Anne were in a relationship. So actually, when you think about it, 
Charles cheated on her and then Mariana tells Anne she has a plan to go around and be with all these other men to try and get back at Charles and because she's desperate to have children that was Mariana's one wish was to have children and sadly she never had that wish come true because she was um, potentially infertile or I don't know if Charles was infertile or whatever way it was but yeah it was it was really um really poignant but we'll get on to some of the amazing quotes that Anne says about or says to uh, Mariana because that's what fascinated me about their relationship it was full of tension it was full of passion and it was just really interesting to read about and then the final read sort of biographical fact that I have about Anne is obviously she was an autobiographer so she literally writes every detail and some of the entries I'll be honest are very mundane but I mean back then there's not much you can do I love the sections where she talks about training horses she was a very um, talented horsewoman and she took great pride in working with her horses and teaching them how to drive and ride and all that stuff yeah she just wrote everything down uh, even the most mundane details such as what they had to eat but writing was also always a great source of comfort to Anne and that was another note I related to because writing for me is a very cathartic so, and enjoyable process. So onto slide two which will show the picture of the crypt hand. These are some of the quotes that I wanted to show people that I presented to as to the reasons why I uh, wanted to pick Anne. So that's obviously her crypt hand, her coded hand that was deciphered by Helena Whitbread because a member, I can't remember if it was an uncle or a cousin, but someone in her family once Anne died, they discovered all her writings and they realised it was written in code. They managed to crack the code and what they discovered was obviously all these intimate, intimately written passages. The uncle slash cousin I think it was her uncle it might have been her uncle I can't remember off the top of my head he was shocked but he was um gay himself so he thought we need to burn and we need to destroy them no one can ever know of this but luckily he didn't have the heart to and he hid him in the walls of Shibden Hall which was then uncovered it was hidden behind a panel in the wall and they uncovered it and luckily and then Helena did a lot of the work along other scholars to um decode it so thank goodness for that otherwise she would have been lost to history um so thank goodness her uncle didn't destroy those records or documents otherwise we never would have known which also feeds into the idea of censorship and that was another point that I wanted to make is the idea that um what really inspired me about Anne was the fact that she um not only had the courage to pursue her truth and live her life the way she knew was natural to her but to do this at a time where there was no lexicon for the LGBTQ plus community really or especially for lesbians I mean the word lesbian didn't exist so Anne's having all these complex emotions and she's always she always makes references to it and she struggles with her own sexuality in her journal entries you can see it and she kind of wonders why is she this way and she's very aware of the power she has over other women and she is aware that her mannerisms are much more masculine compared to the average woman and she does also have some quite misogynistic views but you can kind of <laughs> understand from a time period perspective why she's like that she's very much also a product of her own society but she's um she, she's just so aware of herself and it's just really sad that she doesn't have the lexicon like if she was alive now she would have been a high flyer she would have been unstoppable she would have been amazing like she would have achieved well I mean even back then for her own life she did achieve so much but it always makes me sad to think that if Anne was alive now she'd be a massive advocate of the LGBTQ plus community and she would have had an incredible business but yeah and it was kind of her courage and her struggles to accept herself which really helped me to finally accept my own sexual orientation so I owe a lot to Anne Lister basically she was incredible and I'm so like blessed and lucky to have found her writings and discovered her through the show and I'm very excited because season two is in the works for Gentleman Jack and I can't wait it's gonna be great but um yeah and her writings are just full of it was her dark satire and her wit and her comedy that also I really enjoyed so just to give some context here um C stands for Charles Charles Lawton and M is for Mariana she usually uses code and this is in crypt hand that's why I put it in italics to show that it's in crypt hand Charles continues terribly jealous of me 
Mariana thinks we had better be cautious lest he should forbid her writing to me, and therefore desires to hear me hear from me every other Tuesday, as there will be little comfort for her and me as long as he lives, and God knows how long that may be. So it's kind of those comments where she's like, basically they were both hoping for Charles's death, um, so they could then live together, which sadly never comes to fruition. But that was their plan. Once Charles died, Mariana would remain a widower, and she would have got with Anne, and they would have lived at Shipton Hall together. That was the plan, but sadly that never happened. Happened. Um, and ch- there was a lot of tension surrounding a will because Charles didn't really like Mariana either and there was like Mariana was petrified that he was going to leave her penniless because obviously back then all your be- woman doesn't own her property all the money belongs to the men and so on and so forth and then the second quote I always consider oh this is um after a pas- passionate night together Anne turns to Mariana and says I always considered your marriage legal prostitution we were both wrong you to do it and I to consent to it so this is referring to the fact that obviously Anne and Mariana like I've mentioned before they were in a relationship years and years before Charles ever came into the picture and Anne is just she can't understand why Mariana keeps going back to him and it's really like emotionally painful for both of them but especially for Anne because this isn't the first time this happens to her there's another woman I think her name is Veer Hobart who gets married she and Anne are on an on have an ongoing relationship oh it's horrible she um Veer ends up uh, marrying a man and Anne is completely destroyed by this and I mean this happens to her multiple times throughout her life and it's just each time it's like it's almost like too much for her to take and it's like she has to watch the people she loves just marry and then they even portray that in the show and Veer um Saran does an amazing job at portraying it she goes to Veer and she's like oh this is my husband and she's literally just like Anne just has a full-on emotional breakdown and is literally sobbing in her lap and it's just it's horrendous and it's how Veer tries to say like oh we can still be friends and she's like how or or was it Anne Walker one of them but anyway there's all these parallels throughout the show and there's one moment where it's like oh um we can still be friends and she's like how can we go back to common friendship now I think it's with Anne Walker and there's just so many powerful parallels and scenes because Anne Walker also gets cold feet and is like oh I don't think I can do this because it's repugnant and it's wrong and it's it's queer is the quote that she used in the show which is very interesting queer obviously back then meaning something like strange and sort of odd and wrong and yeah so the third quote is um this to give reference to uh, to give context to this even Anne and Mariana went on holiday to Wales I believe it was and there was these two famous lesbians there called Lady Eleanor Butler and Miss Ponsonby because they live in a little cottage together and they were famous lesbians at the time or well known obviously like I said before this was before the lexicon of the LGBTQ plus community in terms of lesbianism and things like that so they weren't really known um they wouldn't have been known as that but it was obvious that they were both in a relationship or something was going on there and it's really sad because Mariana writes this letter to Anne saying oh no sorry it wasn't that they both didn't go it was Mariana went on holiday to Wales and she's writing a letter to Anne to tell her about it so um Mariana thinks that it's platonic and is like oh I did she feels like such rejoice that oh I didn't know friendship could be this way and it's like basically she's reducing their relationship to friendship but this is Anne's thoughts about that letter and she's like I cannot help thinking that surely it was not platonic heaven forgive me but I look within myself and doubt I feel the infirmity of our nature and hesitate to pronounce such attachments uncemented by something more tender still than friendship and it's kind of like showing that uh, conflict Anne has within herself because she knows in her heart that she loves Mariana and she loves women and there's another brilliant quote that she has is, is something along the lines of I'm ad libbing here but it's like the um I can only love the fairer sex and it's just for Anne she knows she can never love a man she could never look at a man and feel attraction which um was very similar to sort of my experiences growing up like when girls typically or what's the word (laughs) I've (laughs) I've actually forgotten the word heterosexual there you go oh my god Heteros- <laughs> heterosexual girls um when they're teenagers adolescents they stereotypically go through their boy crazy phase well that never happened to me back during my time at senior school i very much just looked at all the juvenile boys and i thought 
what is there to be impressed about i feel zero sense of attraction everyone around me seems to be going boy crazy and all i can think about is that they look so juvenile and there's just nothing attractive about them whatsoever um because i was repressed very much very much repressed but it was quotes like this that just they hit me and like obviously this was during the summer like i've only sort of well i'm not like i guess this is technically almost like a public coming out video in a way because i'm not I'm not the type of person that wears my sexual orientation on my sleeve. I keep it to myself um, and I'm still very freshly out. Although pretty much even before I knew what the word gay was, like I know that I've been born, I know that I was born this way and I know that I've always been this way, like ever since I was young. So like I've always been aware, but due to my own experiences, I very much repressed that side of myself for a very long time. So during the research of this, um after like when i finished my second year of university um that summer i was very much um i was very much sort of dealing with a lot of emotions and a lot of feelings and reading these journals i got that like terrible sinking feeling in my stomach and i just thought oh god like this is stirring up a lot of things that i've kept locked away for so long but just seeing anne's courage once again it, it gave me the courage to accept myself and make those sort of steps to be happy and i'm really really glad that i did and then the final quote was written in her sort of normal script which is why i didn't italicize it and it's writing my journal has composed and done me good so it always does and that was just a nice thing to put in there because for a lot of us as creative writers writing is a very cathartic process so that's where we got that quote from it just it resonated with me and i thought it'd be nice to share with the group and then finally on to slide three this was to talk about like the writing process and any issues we ran into so my biggest issues was like event selection and timeline so i made a massive document of all the amazing quotes because anne has so many amazing quotes and things that happen it was trying to decide well what do i actually want to write about like having this wealth of material to work with and i decided to go for a pivotal moment in mariana and anne's relationship where they have this massive argument and to cut a long story short basically mariana has come to visit anne at shipton hall anne breaks all forms of social convention marches across the blackstone edge moors for miles and miles in like the pouring wind and rain to meet mariana and she actually in the real life version she climbs somehow climbs up onto the back of the carriage and in through the window and sits with her and like mariana is shocked and she's like she i think she has one of her sisters with her um who's asleep and she's like what will my like servants think like how could you do this to me why 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 and basically it's just goes off at her and Anne very uncharacteristically because Anne says it Anne says it how it is like she doesn't beat around the bush even though she kind of also censors herself in her journal she also was quite a forthright woman but she just says she actually apologizes which is very uncharacteristic uncharacter for Anne Anne doesn't apologize in arguments and she says something to the effect of like she just she couldn't help herself she just wanted to see her and she thought that she thought it would be a lovely surprise but mariana doesn't take it well at all because of this it's a very painful event and there's not much detail in the journals as to what happens so for the fact and fiction i thought it'd be perfect because i was able to give life to the argument i was able to reference lots of different parts of their relationship from the journals and sort of create my own version of what happened and i actually made it more dramatic because why not it's a storytelling thing by actually getting mariana which i thought would be much more what should have happened mariana actually get out of the carriage send her servants away and they have it out on the moors like they have a fight and they have verbal fist fisticuffs as well as physical and you know sort of do that and then the sort of narrative perspective was really hard to pinpoint because i even though it's her journals are obviously in first person and does a lot of self-censoring and a lot of um she she'll try and say one thing she'll try and say one thing and then she'll um she'll cover it up so one moment she'll be like oh i love mariana like i want to be with her and then the next day or whenever she's writing she'll be like oh i hate her like i can do away with her i'll find someone better suited to me so that's very much this constant back and forth battle that she uh, uh this constant back and forth battle that she has um 
so in terms of the narrative perspective i decided to write it in third person but then intersperse it with Anne's sort of thoughts so i had like a double layer narrative going on where i had the narrative perspective focalizing Anne, but then actually having Anne's voice in there too and then finally the final point i talked about was just obviously the journal inspiration whenever i got stuck i always referred back to the journals and like i said i had a massive document with all the amazing uh, references that Anne makes that I thought were really powerful that I could utilise in my story or even if I didn't just to look back on for inspiration but anyway if anyone's listened to this thank you so much and it'll be nice to talk a bit more about that story in the next video thank you bye